Hi there! Thank you for joining my session. Today, we're going to talk about how to hack and secure your machine learning environments and systems. To introduce myself, I am Joshua Arvin Latt. People call me Arvs. I am the Chief Technology Officer of NewWorks Interactive Labs, and I'm also an AWS machine learning hero. I'm also the author of the book, Machine Learning with Amazon SageMaker Cookbook. So if you're interested in learning how to perform machine learning experiments and deployments in the cloud, then this may be the book for you. So today, we're going to talk about security. And when talking about security, it's not about understanding the best practices, but it's also about understanding how hackers are able to perform most attacks. So there are different types of attacks. And what we need to understand is, in order for us to implement the security defenses and best practices, we have to understand first what's happening from the offensive side of things. Whenever you have systems, whenever you have different components in your architecture, you have to understand how hackers are able to attack and hack certain parts of your infrastructure and how those resources can be used to further continue the attack. And that said, that would compose an attack chain where hackers would be able to exploit different types of vulnerabilities depending on what's available in that point in time. So once a hacker or attacker is able to compromise certain servers, that hacker would be able to reach a database and maybe the next step is for the hacker to download the data and steal it. And once the data has been stolen, further analysis and other actions would be performed, let's say to steal the passwords, and then those passwords would then be used to attack other accounts. So there are different ways a hacker could perform these things, and it's about us understanding how do we prioritize which ones to protect and what types of security mechanisms do we need to implement to prevent these types of attacks. To further improve our understanding of how this all works, we also need to understand what do we need to protect? What are the different components of the system? If a certain part of the system gets compromised, what is at risk? So here in the screen, we can see that most environments involve the usage of, let's say, a Jupyter Notebook or something similar, and also the infrastructure component, which involves maybe servers or, let's say, containers. containers. Inside those servers and containers, different libraries, frameworks, and packages would be installed. And in some cases, custom code would need to be added. And inside those environments, experiments would then be run to train a machine learning model or models using a given data set. So when you're doing these experiments, in some cases, or maybe in most cases, the data set would contain information about users, which is not supposed to leak outside of that experiment. Therefore, we need to protect the data there. At the same time, the model produced should be protected as well. So if that model gets stolen by the attacker, then the attacker would be able to use that to their advantage. So meaning, we need to protect the resources used and generated inside this ML system and environment. So understanding what are the input values and what are the output values to a machine learning experiment or deployment is crucial because the hacker or attacker may try to implant malicious code to the input parameters. And once the input parameters gets processed and they are used to produce, let's say, an inference endpoint, then the attacker may end up having access to the inference endpoint 
if a certain malicious code block runs while the deployment is happening. So let's give an example. Let's say that you wanted to produce or build or deploy an inference endpoint that hosts uh, a model which allows you to perform a classification of cats and dogs and maybe other animals. So what you did is you downloaded a model and then you deploy that model inside that inference endpoint. So what if that model contains malicious code and then that malicious code basically allows the hacker to connect back to the server where the inference endpoint is running. So this means that the hacker would now have access to that inference endpoint. And instead of your inference endpoint doing predictions, then it may be used to attack other servers, or it may be used to compromise all the other resources in your account. So let's be very careful on understanding what can be compromised because these input values would then be used to produce and generate an output and any of these resources could be attacked by a malicious actor or attacker. So when talking about model deployments, one of the things you should be aware is that whenever a model is deployed, let's say to an inference endpoint or a server, the model needs to be loaded from files. So after training, you would have your model and then your model needs to be converted into a file. So once you need to deploy that model and that model needs to be used for inference or predictions, the model needs to be loaded from a set of files and then that model can now be used in the memory. So the challenge there is that some models are complex and they cannot just be represented with a bunch of numbers and the, the need to use certain libraries is crucial just to be able to save and load the model. And when you use these types of libraries, let's say this library, there's always that warning that we should not use these libraries to load objects from an untrusted source. Because if that untrusted source put a malicious um, payload inside that model, then the malicious payload would run when you load the model. So right now, when you're ever you're trying to learn how to do machine learning, there are some pre-built models available online, and we should be very careful whenever we're using this. Because if you're running your machine learning experiment and deployment in your local machine and you accidentally loaded a malicious model or a model containing malicious code, then your local machine would be compromised. And similarly, in staging and production environments, those resources can be compromised by the attacker the moment you load that model. So we will dive a bit deeper into this one because this is not just a concept. This is rather very simple to exploit because preparing a model with malicious payload is actually easy to create. So before going into the details on how to prepare those things, we have to understand the concepts of the reverse shell and also the bind shell. So whenever we're dealing with security attacks, it's important that we have an idea on how hackers are able to connect to certain resources and servers. So there are different types of shells and whenever a certain malicious code runs, it's possible for that malicious code to open a port and then that port is used by the hacker to perform a bind shell. And basically, it's your hacker trying to connect to a compromised server. A reverse shell, on the other hand, is the reverse, meaning something is listening 
from the attacker machine. And then when your target machine or your target server suddenly runs the malicious payload inside, let's say, the model, if the model is loaded, the malicious code would then try to connect back to the attacker machine so that the attacker would now be able to perform the needed actions on the target computer. So if that's a bit confusing, it's better to use a diagram instead. So let's say we have two computers. The first one is the attacker machine, and then the second one would be the victim machine. The victim machine would most likely be a machine learning environment or a server running a machine learning process or experiment. So the victim machine, when it loads the malicious file, the malicious file would then run a set of commands. And when that set of commands are executed, it would then create a connection between the attacker machine and the victim machine. So of course, in order for all of this to happen, the attacker machine needs to be set up auto and it's ready to listen through a certain port. So in this case, we're going to use the port 14344, for example, and then the victim machine would then run the code block by loading the malicious file. So then what happens there is that the malicious file would then run a set of scripts or a set of lines, and it would then connect back to the attacker machine. So what happens next? So the attacker machine would now be able to run commands inside the victim machine because they are now connected. So if the attacker machine wants to download all the files, the attacker can do it. If the attacker can delete all files, that's possible as well. It can create files as if it was their own computer. And in addition to this, um, if let's say there are limited permissions to the current user obtained by the attacker, the attacker may also be able to perform privilege escalation. So what's happening there is that the attacker will try to get root through a variety of means from a user account with less permissions. So that's possible as well. So this is like a maze or a puzzle where the attacker tries a variety of ways to get full access. And once there's full access, the attacker will be able to do more things. So how would this work? In order for a file to contain a payload, the payload needs to be generated first. So here we can see Python code which allows us to generate a payload. Basically, a payload is included as part of the normal data. And then there's that malicious payload included so that when the normal data is loaded, the payload is run as well. So let, let's say that you have the data for the model and the attributes of the model, the weights, etc. The payload would be included in the model so that when the model is loaded, the payload is run also. So in this case, we are allowing our payload to be customizable and configurable so that when we, let's say when we're just testing the payload, maybe we can just set the IP address to localhost. And then when we need to use this payload in a real environment, then we just change the IP address to the public IP address of the target of the attacker machine and then we can just specify the port. So once the payload is ready, you can now include that payload to the different files such as the pcal file. And here, what we will do is we will create a file, for example here, model.pcal. And we will dump the object and that object contains the payload which would automatically run upon load. So how would this happen? So when you load it using the same library, let's say pickle.load, then the payload would run. So the different bash commands in the previous slide would run automatically, and it would make the target computer connect back 
to the attacker server. So the target server would connect back to the attacker server. And basically, that's game over. So given that we have talked about Pickle files a bit, let's do a deep dive and see how do we analyze malicious Pickle files and how do we ensure that we are protected from these types of attacks. So there's something called Pickle Tools. So let's say that you downloaded a malicious file or maybe you generated your own malicious Pickle file. You can use the Pickle Tools to analyze what's inside that Pickle file. So if you run this command, the one at the top, you would see that, oh, there's a payload there which uses Netcat to connect back to the attacker machine. So this is very dangerous because if you do not know which tools are available to analyze these files, and you basically just loaded a malicious file out there, then it's game over for your system. So before trying to load anything to your system, it's important that one, we know who shared that file. And second, we need to know which tools allow us to understand what's happening inside. And if there's a chance for us not to use an external model at all, then that's better. Because we don't know what's happening inside. And sometimes, we have no idea that our machine has already been compromised. So what libraries or frameworks are affected? So if we were to use Pickle, then yes, if you use Pickle.load, then the machine running the code would be compromised. So in this case, we have an example of a Flask application which basically loads the model whenever the predict function is used to perform inference. So yes, so this is a custom type of Flask application. And yeah, if the Flask application loads the model, then the payload and the commands would run and it's game over. Similarly with PyTorch and Joblib, what happens here is if you use these lines of code to load that pickle file, that same pickle file, then the reverse shell would be triggered as well. So wow, right? It's just a single file and different types of libraries and frameworks are vulnerable to this type of attack. So your question right now is, how do we load pickle files more securely? So earlier, what's happening inside that pickle file is we're using some built-in um, libraries or packages to perform other actions. So pickle files ideally just contain simple data, let's say integers, floats, strings. But in this case, it contains commands. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to restrict which commands and which built-ins are allowed whenever we, per 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 we perform the unpickling process. So here with this custom code, if we try to load the same file, this would produce an error because the whitelisted built-in commands um, are fairly limited to what is allowed. So if you use something that would run a malicious command, let's say system, let's, let's say you use os.system to run a bash command, then that one would be rejected and this would produce an error. So this is one of the, the more secure ways to load pickle files. Next, let's talk about malicious YAML files. Let's say we have generated the payload similar to the previous example. The question here is, can we also perform the same type of attack with YAML files? So if you have an idea of what YAML files are, it's basically, um, it's similar to JSON, but this time there are dashes and there are nested values 
which allows you to organize the structure. However, the YAML files, which may contain configuration files, can also contain commands. And the scary thing there is that if you load a YAML file, a malicious payload containing a runnable command would then be loaded and then the, the runnable command would load automatically upon load. So here, let's say we run the save YAML function and we created the malicious.yaml file using the dump method. What happens here is that a YAML file like this is created, the one at the top, and then when you use the load YAML function, then the payload would run, and yes, a reverse shell would be initiated, and it's game over for your server. So again, if you have, let's say, a Django application or a Flask application, and you have code like this which loads a YAML file, and the YAML file, for some reason, contains malicious code, then it's game over for your system. So there are different ways this could happen because if you are building an application which makes use of a YAML file uploaded by the attacker, then yes, your system would run these types of um, processes and in some cases, a malicious actor would upload a malicious YAML file. So yes, be very careful about this because it may seem that it's not possible for this to happen, especially when, when the YAML files are generated by an internal team. However, if there's a user or a developer from your team who uploads a malicious YAML file, or if you extend the functionality of your server to load YAML files from an ex from external sources, then this server can be compromised. So now, your next question is, how do we load our YAML files more securely? So before, this has been um, discovered. So what they did is, they basically implemented the safe, the safe load method. So here, you can see that the code is very similar to the previous one, except that we're using the safe load method instead. So the great thing here is that if there's something malicious inside your YAML file, then this one would produce an error. Of course, before loading the YAML files, make sure that you analyze what's inside because you should be able to read what's inside the YAML files. Now, let's talk about malicious.h5 files. So when you're using the machine learning frameworks and when you're performing machine learning experiments, there are also files like this where, let's say your neural networks, your models there are saved into a file. In some cases, you can create a custom layer, let's say with TensorFlow, and using the Lambda layer, you would be able to run custom commands. So that's the tricky part when you're introducing flexibility. And that flexibility is being taken advantage of by attackers. So in this case, the same payload, the one that we talked about earlier, is included in the custom layer function. And then when you save the model, this function, which includes the payload, is saved inside the model.h5 file. So what happens when you use the load model function to load the same file. So what happens there is the custom function, basically the custom layer runs and the payload is executed as well. So, what's happen so what happens, it's game over for your system and your system would now trigger a reversal back to the attacker machine and the attacker would be able to perform the other types of attacks. So it's scary because people think, oh, I'm no longer going to use Pickle. I'm no longer going to use um, YAML files to store my model files. Let's use something which is different. But in reality, different types of files would have its own way 
for attackers to perform their attacks. So always check and always research what's possible because even if you, again, if you avoid pickle and you use that H5 instead and you use a different approach to save your model or load a model, there's no guarantee that there's no known attack for it. So one of the safer ways to protect your system is to enable network isolation. So what do we mean by network isolation? Let's say that you're performing a machine learning experiment and there's one server. In most cases, you would not need to download additional packages just to perform that experiment. Ideally, all the needed resources have been downloaded before the experiment happens. So when, let's say, you use or run code, or maybe you use a model during that experiment, if there's net network isolation enabled, then the malicious code would not be able to connect back to the attacker machine because there's no internet connection. It's not allowed. So that's one of the tricks whenever performing experiments and deployments because if there's no internet connection to the outside world, then the target machine cannot connect to the attacker machine. So how do you enable this? So if you're using, let's say, a cloud provider, let's say AWS, GCP, or Azure, then you can set up the virtual private cloud and ensure that the experiments and deployments are running inside an isolated network with no internet connectivity. So that when you try to download packages or you try to connect to another server, then that would be rejected and that's not possible. So in order for us to understand how this works, we have a diagram here. So even if let's say that there's malicious code inside the .h5 file, or if let's say you accidentally loaded a pickle file containing a malicious code block, even if your Flask or Django or your Pyramid servers loaded that model, even if the malicious code executes, it's not able to connect back to the attacker machine. So there. So this is one of the, the easier ways to prevent these types of attacks. The next types of attacks we need to talk about would be privilege escalation. So in some of the machine learning environments and platforms, for example, Amazon SageMaker, Amazon SageMaker makes use of IAM rules to perform certain actions or it uses the IAM role to access certain resources. So what's IAM? IAM is Identity and Access Management. And what's happening with SageMaker, or maybe any similar uh, tool or service, is that it automatically uses that server's credentials to emulate a role. So what's happening here is that inside your notebook instance, there's credentials inside. And then all you need to do is use get execution role and you would be able to assume, assume the role automatically even if you don't hard code the credentials. So if that's a bit confusing, all you need to understand is that in the code, in the Jupyter Notebook code, there are no credentials there. And what the code does is that it basically looks for the credentials from the environment and you're able to use a role's permissions to perform certain actions. So what if you are running a workshop? So in the workshop, you created, let's say, 50 IAM users for 50 um, participants who want to learn about machine learning. So you gave them access to an account and what you did is you created IAM permissions and IAM users with limited access. And the access that they have is basically the ability to open 
notebook instances. So the notebook instances would have the different um, notebooks and those notebooks can now be used to perform machine learning experiments. So what's going to happen here is even if the IAM users have limited permission to, let's say, to do things, if the notebook instance has a more permissive IAM role attached to it, then a malicious actor in the form of a participant would be able to perform privilege escalation and basically perform other actions that the normal or the original IAM user is not able to do. So let's say that the IAM user is only able to access notebook instance. If for some reason, the notebook instance has the ability to manage IAM permissions through incorrect configuration, then the hacker can now use that notebook instance, steal the credentials, and use those credentials to escalate privileges. So make sure that you practice the principle of list privilege because an attacker would be able to use the other resources to, to increase and add permissions to the original limited permission set. And here, it's about understanding what types of resources and what types of permissions are attached or linked to different resources. Because nowadays, there are different ways to perform actions. The first one is through the usage of secret keys and access keys. And the second one may involve permissions attached to resources so that no access keys are needed to perform certain permissions especially when you are inside of those resources. So in this case, if there's full administration access allowed from those resources, then once those resources are hacked or compromised or accessed, then everything else can be for performed already. So that's game over for your system. So the technique here is to use tools which when run, can automatically audit the permissions attached to the different resources in your cloud account. The next topic on our list would be attacks on data privacy and model privacy. So even if you're able to secure your machine learning environment and from an infrastructure and network perspective, things may be secure, if you have a public API where your model is hosted and your model is used to perform inference, then it is possible for your attacker to perform different types of attacks to steal the data and to steal the model. So imagine the, the number of weeks or months for your data science team to produce a model. And even if your model is only accepting an input payload, and basically it just returns an output response with a crafted set of inputs, an attacker may be able to steal or know information about your data or your model. For example, let's say that you have a model trained using data containing sensitive information about users. So with a carefully crafted attack, let's say, let's choose one here, membership inference attack. Let's say your attacker performed a well-crafted attack. That attacker may be able to infer if the data of a certain user is inside the data set used to train the model. So that's pretty scary because you want your model to assume that that's not possible, right? So you don't want your data to be used to train a model just for it to be stolen by the attacker. And in some cases, it is possible for the attacker to reverse engineer the data used to train the model. And that's quite scary. So even if 
it's black box, meaning the hacker does not have control over the model. Again, with a carefully crafted set of inputs, different types of attacks are possible. And even the model itself, the attributes, can be inferred and, and the model can be extracted by the attacker. So this is not an attack on the infrastructure. It's an attack on the model itself. And the scary thing here is that hackers may be able to check if certain records are inside the training data set used to train the model. So there are different ways to protect this. And there are different libraries and frameworks available. Let's say there's TensorFlow privacy, and then there's the Opacus library for PyTorch. And it's about using those libraries to whenever you're training your model. And in some cases, all you need to do is change a few lines of code just to protect the model and the data from attackers. The other thing we need to do whenever we're managing machine learning environments and systems is we need to enable aggressive and detailed account action monitoring. So what do we mean by this? So let's say we have a bunch of prediction endpoints using an API gateway tool or service. And we, let's say we have a Lambda function um, hosting, let's say, a scikit-learn model, or maybe a model um, trained using TensorFlow, or maybe a Lambda function using Facebook Profit. Whenever you deploy something in the cloud, usually we, th we think that the deployment is over once it's working. However, it is crucial for us to collect the logs of the input and the output so that we can analyze the behavior of our model and we are able to detect if there are malicious requests. So if you're able to analyze those requests quickly, we would be able to prevent different types of attacks. Because as mentioned in the previous slide, even if the infrastructure is secure, different types of attacks are possible just by performing well-crafted inputs. So again, make sure to have a proper log management strategy and you should be able to analyze the logs really fast in order for you to detect different types of issues and attacks. The next thing in our list is automated vulnerability management. What we want to do here is that we need to make sure that our code and our resources are assessed from the outside or maybe from the inside. So what do I mean by that? So there are different types of vulnerability assessment scanners and some scanners basically simulate an attack or basically they perform different types of requests to check if your system is vulnerable to different types of attacks. It's also possible to have an assessment tool which analyzes what's installed inside so that no requests would need to be performed. So that's a more silent type of vulnerability assessment. So what's important here is to make use of automated scanners so that whenever there's a change, or maybe you pushed a new container image, or you updated your server, you want your scanners to run automatically and you want the different vulnerabilities, especially the new ones, to be detected right away so that your security engineers or your security team can easily analyze those vulnerabilities and if those vulnerabilities need to be patched right away. So if those vulnerabilities are exploitable, then yes, you have to make sure that you're able to patch that and remove and remediate those vulnerabilities before launching a certain set of features online. So even if you don't know that there are vulnerabilities, hackers would be able to test it. So the game plan here is to test your system regularly for vulnerabilities 
so that you're able to patch it before someone else finds out. So that's pretty much it. We were able to talk about the different types of attacks possible and we were able to share the different types of security best practices and techniques in order to secure our system. So again, this is not an exhaustive list and there's definitely a lot more when it comes to security of machine learning environments. And it's about us knowing what attacks are possible and knowing what are the steps to prevent these types of attacks. So thank you again for listening to my talk and hope you learned something new. Bye-bye.